Margaret Huang, who joins us today, an advocate for human rights and racial justice for more than two decades, is the executive director of Amnesty International USA. As the chief executive officer, Ms. Huang is responsible for advancing the vision and mission of the organization, managing the organization's day-to-day -day operations and activities, serving as the lead spokesperson for the organization, and ensuring the organization's financial health. She has worked with members of Congress on critical pieces of legislation, and she has advocated before the United Nations Human Rights Mechanisms, as well as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. She has published articles and opinion pieces on human rights, and she has authored a chapter, Going Global, Appeals to International and Regional Human Rights Bodies and Human Rights at Home, published by Prager Publishers. Ms. Huang's opinion pieces have been published in The Time, The Washington Post, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, Rolling Stone, the Miami Herald, and numerous other leading outlets. And she has been interviewed on National Public Radio, CNN, NBC, News, Al Jazeera, and other global and domestic media. She regularly speaks on human rights issues to national and international associations, universities, conferences, and today to you. Please welcome Margaret. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for making the time to be here today. I really appreciate it. Um, let's start with to get to know you a little bit. Where did okay. you grow up? Where, where are you from? Uh, well, forgive me. I already mentioned this to my table over lunch today. I grew up in East Tennessee. I grew up in a very small town in the Appalachian Mountains. My parents were professors at the university in the town. And I couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> I left for college in Washington, D.C., and I have only gone back for a very few visits, um, but that's where I grew up, and it definitely gave me, I would say, an unusual perspective on human rights from a southern, from a poor area of the United States that I appreciate. Yeah. Um, how did your career with Amnesty International start? So I actually started my career doing international human rights work, um, and I was a major advocate for women's rights. I focused in particular on Asia, and I traveled all across the region. Um, I had some extraordinary opportunities to work with activists, really, in all the countries of Asia, um, and was very inspired by the people that I worked with. And I was doing a lot of international travel and working with ad activists all around the world when September 11th happened. And the combination of September 11th and what unfolded here in the United States and the rollback on human rights protections domestically also happened at the same time that I had my first child. And so for me, suddenly traveling internationally wasn't quite the appeal that it had been. And even more importantly, I felt like there was really critical work to do here in the United States. That's a longer explanation you're yeah. asking for, but no. <laughs> so that's when I made a shift. I started doing domestic human rights work, and I worked on um, issues of criminal justice, on the rights of farm workers and domestic workers here in the United States. Um, I worked on issues of immigration, detention, and enforcement, on racial profiling, which is one of our big campaigns. And then I came to Amnesty, and it's the very first time that any organization has asked me to do both domestic and international human rights work at the same time. And it's been a gift over the last three years. Um, this is a student question I really like. What fuels your desire to help people, to help others, and how do you stay committed on a daily basis? There's a, a you deal with some really, really heavy, heavy stuff. How do you, how are you able to stay committed on that daily basis? One of the things that I love about Amnesty. We try very hard to fix the policies and the laws that cause human rights abuses and to, to influence dictators and authoritarian leaders who try to abuse human rights. But we also champion individuals. And it's one of the things that before I came to Amnesty to work, I was always a little curious about that focus on the individual. I was much more focused on fixing the laws and fixing the policies. What I have learned since coming to Amnesty is that focusing on individuals really works. Last year in 2016, I just learned this morning, Amnesty won the release of 650 people around the world from unfair uh, incarceration or detention. 
650 people. That's a lot. In fact, if you looked over the history of Amnesty, you could fill Madison Square Garden with the number of people that we have freed from unfair incarceration. That's amazing. And when you meet one of those people, which I have had the privilege of doing, I am so inspired, I can't wait to go back out there and right. do this for another right. 10 years. Right. So that's really where I get a lot of the fuel for my desire, is when I can actually meet people who have benefited and who've had you know, the opportunity to get that support from Amnesty. And it makes a huge difference, not right. only in their lives, but in mine. Right. Um, you you kind of mentioned a little bit about the structure of being mm -hmm. able to do both. And I wanted to ask you, so Amnesty International is an international organization. What's, how is America's role in that, Amnesty International USA's role yeah. in that international organization? Well, it will not surprise any of you to know that it's changing at the moment, but Amnesty USA is one of 70 national sections of Amnesty International. So we have offices all around the world in every region of the world, um, and I have 69 counterparts who run their national office just like I do. Um, then we also have an international secretariat who staffs and supports the entire movement. And the headquarters are in London, but over the last five years, we've actually spread out and opened new regional offices around the world. And so I now have colleagues working in Dakar, in Nairobi, in Hong Kong, in um, Thailand, and in Lima, and in Mexico City. All of them are working on regional human rights issues, even while they're also supporting the global agenda. So in fact, in a few weeks, I'm heading off to Sri Lanka, and I'm going to be meeting with the directors of all the other national offices, plus the representatives from those regional offices, so we can strategize together and try to figure out how we address the particular challenges of this moment. OK. Um, how do you decide domestically what human rights violations receive the most support and attention and how is the international agenda determined? How are those two things decided? It's actually kind of similar. So last year, we undertook a major strategic planning process that actually involved our membership in helping us to decide where to set our priorities. We had more than 7,000 people, uh, members of Amnesty, who took part in surveys, in discussions, in consultations, and in interviews, and we proposed an agenda that prioritized a certain list of issues to work on. Um, and that was adopted by consensus by the membership and also approved by our board, which is elected from our membership. So it was a very democratic and very yeah. long consultative yeah. process to produce that. It's actually not dissimilar at the international level. Um, we have the 70 sections that I talked about, national offices, all consult with their members and then propose to the international movement what priorities should be for the next two to four years. At the moment, the priorities for both the U.S. section and for the global movement are actually the same. We have two priority campaigns. One is on refugee rights, and one is on the rights of human rights defenders. And by that phrase, what I mean is people who might stand up in opposition to governments or who might be willing to be activists in the face of harassment, intimidation, and arrest. People who believe that they have to be champions of human rights wherever they are. And for both of those campaigns, we have both things we're doing here in the United States as well as things we're doing globally to protect rights. Give an example of, of um, as a human rights defender, yeah. what it is you're talking about. Well, it's interesting. When we approved the, the global campaign on human rights defenders, I think the assumption was we were going to be focusing primarily in places like the Middle East and Africa, uh -huh. where a lot of human rights champions have been under harassment, under surveillance, have been arrested, some of them have been thrown in jail. And in many of the countries of the Middle East and Africa, there's actually been a slew of legislative bills introduced, some of them passed, that would criminalize uh, activism and opposition to government policy. So when we approved the campaign, that's where we thought a lot of our energies would be going. I'm actually dismayed to tell you that we've now expanded that work to include a very significant body of work here in the United States. Um, we're really concerned about the growing opposition to using protest and civic activism in this country to oppose our government's positions. I can tell you that Amnesty has sent four deployments of human rights observers to Standing Rock, North Dakota. 
And Ooh. we actually sent them thank you. I know. We sent them at the request of the tribe because the tribe was worried that what was happening was not getting attention. We started back in August, and there was really very little national attention, media attention to what was going on. So we sent observers out with the specific function of observing how the police were responding to the protesters. And we documented some incredible abuses. They were, they were using water cannons. That actually happened later when it got below freezing. They were using water cannons to freeze uh, protesters who were simply peacefully protesting on the site. Um, the private security guards at Standing Rock were using dogs to attack children and elderly people who were protesting. They've also arrested dozens and dozens of protesters who were simply peacefully protesting, and they've charged all of them with felonies, which means if they're found guilty, they're all going to have to serve jail time for peacefully protesting. And that's really unheard of. Peaceful protest has never been treated as a felony in this country, and, and now it is. And we're, we've seen a whole slew of bills introduced in the North Dakota State Legislature that would actually criminalize protests. Um, so we're concerned that the same problems we thought we were going to be trying to fight in the Middle East and Africa are now starting to happen here in the United States. Wow. <coughs> that was a great answer. <laughs> oh, <Long one. laughs> it was a great answer. Um, who are, well, this is one of my favorite questions. And Selena, where are you? I think she's the one that, there you are. It's a great question. We took a lot of questions from students, and this is one of my favorites. Who are Amnesty's operatives in countries like Saudi Arabia or North Korea? Um, where the governments are suspicious of watchdogs? How do you obtain your information about potential human rights abuses? And how do you, and this for me is really important, how do you substantiate that information? Great question. Isn't it? Isn't it a great question? <laughs> um, so we do not have national offices in North Korea uh, or in Syria at the moment. But I can tell you, just two weeks ago, we came out with a new report on um, arbitrary executions in Syrian prisons. And we actually got that research done by interviewing former guards, former judges, and former detainees who had been in the Syrian prisons. Some of the interviews did take place in Syria, and I'll be honest with you, Amnesty does sneak in researchers where we can. Um, it's always done illegally, so we have to be very careful when we do that, because we're all about observing the rule of law, and we try not to violate the law. But sometimes to do our research, we, we do have to go into places where otherwise we would not be allowed in. Yeah. Um, so we did have researchers on the ground in Syria, but we also interviewed people who'd left Syria, who had worked in the prison or had been <coughs> detained in the prison, and we have first-hand documentation. <coughs> so the report is based on more than 80 interviews of people who had either been detained or who had worked in the, in the prison that we reported on. And what we documented is that there have been more than 65,000 people who've been arbitrarily killed by the Syrian government who were detained at that prison. Right now, what they're doing is almost every week, they take 50 prisoners out of their cells. They give them a two-minute trial where they're not allowed to offer defense and they're not allowed to have a lawyer. And then they take them out in the backyard and shoot them. And they're doing about 50 at a time. We documented uh, the period between 2011 and 2015, um, but we have every reason to believe that that practice is still happening today. So we can't verify that because we can't get into the prison. And in fact, no one's been able to get into the prison to see what's happening, including the Red Cross. But that's how we do it. We, we did sneak in a researcher to, um, to Nauru, which is an island off the coast of Australia. We knew that the government of Australia was sending refugees seeking asylum to Nauru instead yeah. of allowing them to yeah. enter Australia. And uh, Nauru would not allow people to come in and do research. So we sent one of our researchers in as a tourist, and she just happened to tourist her way through the refugee camps on Nauru and did documentation and interviews. And we came out with that report in the fall. Um, and it has spurred quite a lot of criticism within Australia for their practice of offshore processing of refugees. So we do sneak people in when we have to, but we, we always try where we can to have people who actually have permission to go in and do the research. It's just hard in some places. I'm sorry. Um, you might also want to speak to some of the satellite work with North Korea. Uh, that, that Jack Renmer is doing? So I'm, we, have a, we actually have Sorry. a country expert who is a volunteer who is an expert on North Korea. 
Um, and he's traveled all across Asia and has, I believe, entered North Korea as well, but he has to do so not officially as amnesty. Um, but he does a lot of advocacy for us before the United Nations and other places around what's happening in North Korea. I have to ask, who are these people? Do they, like, apply for a job for amnesty? Like, I'm going to sneak it. I mean, who are these, who are these yeah. advocates that you're sending out and the watchdogs? And, and give me a profile of the type of person mm -hmm. that is that a, a job they apply for in amnesty? Yeah. How does so, that happen? <laughs> so we have a few different jobs. Um, we have researchers, and the researcher's job is to go into the situation to do investigation to interview people who can provide first-hand testimony. Um, some of those people feel more comfortable in conflict zones than others. Some of them feel more comfortable in places where they speak the language and they can do it. Others um, are willing to go anywhere at any time. We also have a crisis team, and the crisis team is actually even more, I think, impressive. They are willing to go into situations where armed conflict is happening to try to document what's happening on the ground. One of our newest hires is someone who is ex-military, who has expertise in understanding munitions yeah. and weapons. Yeah. So when there is a conflict, when, for example, Boko Haram comes into a village and kills everyone in, northern, in a village in northern Nigeria, we can now send this crisis researcher in, and he can look at the weapons that were used, the bullets that they collect, and in some, some cases bombs and other things, and he can actually determine who is providing those weapons to Boko Haram. And then they can trace who's ultimately responsible for helping to fuel that civil conflict. So we have those kinds of people with expertise on yeah. staff who can really bring to bear what is not typically a human rights yeah. um, experience to understanding what's happening on the ground. Yeah. Two more questions about kind of structure yeah. amnesty. Um, how do you guys fund yourselves? How is, how is amnesty funded? Um, how much time do you spend fundraising? <laughs> and um, are there companies, individuals, <laughs> talk a little bit about your source of funding, and then, um, and where does that money, I imagine the money goes to places like, let's send this, yeah. this guy to Nigeria and, yeah. and stuff like that, but talk a little bit about Yeah, that. about the budget. It's a great question. Um, Amnesty is a really unique organization. Most nonprofits that I know rely pretty heavily on donations from foundations. Um, and so, you know, foundations who give grants to support programmatic work Foundation money is less than 1% of our revenues. Unlike most nonprofit organizations, we get the vast majority of our funding from individuals who join and support Amnesty. So about 95% of all of our revenues wow. come from people like you, wow. <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, we also have more than 200,000 individual members who pay the amount that is required to be a member of Amnesty, which is $25 a year. $15 for students, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and so that means we have 200, more than 200,000 people who call themselves active members of Amnesty in the country. That's in the US. We do not take any government funding from any government anywhere. We do not take any corporate funding, although in theory we could if a corporation passed our vetting, mm -hmm. which no one has yet. Right. <laughs> so in practice, we don't accept corporate money. Right. Um, and then our budget, um, actually in the U.S. section, what I can share with you, we, ha we are going to have a budget this year of almost $40 million. Of that $40 million, we're going to give approximately $12 million to supporting our global organization. So we don't keep it in the United States. We actually donate it to support human rights work in the global south, to support the crisis researchers yeah. who yeah. go everywhere. Yeah. So that's the U.S section's contribution to the global work. Are we wealthier in those contributions? Are we contributing more than So at than the other? moment, we are the largest section yeah. in terms of contribution. I will say our, our sister section in the UK was ahead of us yeah. last year, and after the Brexit vote and the drop in currency favoring uh -huh. uh, the pound, we suddenly became <coughs> the larger section right. of donations. Right. But we run about equal. It's the UK and the United States who contribute the most to the global movement. Yep. Um, Last question, structurally, I want to talk about is um, Amnesty International's relationship with the media. It's mm -hmm. a talk a little bit about your relationship with the media as an institution and an organization, and um, and how have you guys? I mean, I guess from from an outsider looking in, that it would seem as if the media really trusts you, you guys, 
at least that's my impression. Yeah. It might just be on the liberal media I'm watching. <laughs> so, you know, I understand my own biases, but right. talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, Amnesty's research is actually very, very carefully vetted. Um, we do not publish anything in our research that hasn't been confirmed by at least two sources. There's no alternative facts. There are no alternative facts. <laughs> Um, and we, we do a lot of checking of all of the things that we put in. It's, we never just include one testimony without yeah. verifying that it's um, been uh, approved by, you know, agreed with by somebody else who's a first-hand testimony as well. So that is why the media likes our work, because yeah. they know it's already been yeah. vetted, and, and they have to do their own vetting, of course, of any story, but they, they start with the basis of assuming that our work is really trustworthy, yeah. which helps a lot. Um, I will say, you know, I think, I think for a very long time the media in this country turned to Amnesty particularly for information about human rights abuses in other parts of the world. And there's a broad perception in the United States that Amnesty, because we're global, our expertise is international. And that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but what I would say is we've gotten a lot less attention for the work that we've done here domestically. And Amnesty has been doing human rights work in the United States for more than three decades. But people don't think, oh, the human rights group that works on the U.S. is Amnesty. They probably think of the ACLU, which is why they keep getting these big donations from everyone. But we think it's really important to talk about Amnesty's work here. We've, we've yeah. worked on the death penalty for three decades. We've worked on criminal justice reform, including police accountability, the use yeah. of tasers. We've worked on violence against women. We had a major campaign for several years here in the United States. So there's a lot of things that we do here, and that's part of where yeah. I'm hoping to get the media paying more attention to our role here and our focus on human rights abuses here as we go forward. Well, let's get into that a little bit <coughs> cool. and, and talk um, about integration. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Homeland Security issued a sweeping set of orders yesterday um, to deport the 11 million undocumented immigrants in our country. Um, I'm not naive in asking this question, but so much of the media around everything that I've seen does not speak of this in a human rights capacity. My question is this. Can you explain why deporting 11 million people is a human rights issue? Yeah. Immigration to the United States is never a straightforward black and white proposition. If you are an immigrant from the Philippines and you want to come to the United States and be reunited with, say, your brother who moved to the United States decades ago, if you want to get in line and follow the procedures that are required to get you here legally, you will wait 26 years. <laughs> so we're telling people who want to be unified with their family members if you want to come legally, wait 26 years to come. If you want to come from Mexico, the waiting, the waiting time is 16 years. Right now, the US immigration system favors places where we don't have a lot of immigration. It's a lot easier, your line is shorter. And we take quotas of legal migrants from different countries of the world. And that's why, for some places, it's so hard. And why people don't want to wait and get in line the way that uh, a lot of politicians talk about it, because it essentially means they're never going to be reunited with their families. The Congress has tried for the last two decades to reform our immigration system because they recognize this is a problem. Yeah. And this is not the only problem. There are people who want to come and work, and actually companies here really want them to come and work, and there aren't enough visas to allow skilled laborers to come to this country and get jobs. There are also are not good pathways for people who are unskilled labor to come to the United States. We rely very heavily on unskilled migrant labor to harvest our fruits and vegetables and our, our harvest here in the United States. And they can't come legally to do that because our structures aren't set up to allow them to come across the border and do that work and then go home. So because our system is broken and is not working to actually support the migration that we want, to come in, what we have is a problem where we have 11 million people who are in the country who didn't wait or who came to work and who don't have the documentation that they need. So when you talk about deporting people, you are not talking about drug dealers necessarily. You are not talking about people who pose a threat necessarily. 
you're talking about people who had a whole range of motivations for moving to the United States. And that's why it's been very difficult to understand how to deal with the problem of undocumentation, particularly when you have many, many children who are now US citizens who were born here and whose parents don't have the documentation to stay. So human rights law is actually a little tricky on this issue. As Amnesty International, we cannot say that the United States can't deport anyone, because actually that's a sovereign right that any country in the world has. But what we can say is you should not break up a family and send a parent home because they don't have documentation, but the children do. That's a violation of international law. So there are ways to enforce immigration laws that respect family primacy, that respect that many of the people who are here actually fled violence and civil conflict. We believe that a lot of the people here without documentation actually have legitimate claims as asylum seekers, but they're also here undocumented. And so if these enforcement raids sweep up people and deport them back to Central America or Mexico, many of them will face personal risk um, to them and to their families that in we're not taking into account. And the sweeping rules are, are not going to allow for us to sift through each person's individual case. It's <coughs> That's um, right. So for Amnesty, we're, we're focusing a lot on those two issues. We're focusing on, for example, a lot of the unaccompanied children who've crossed the southern border in the last yeah. two years. There's yeah. been more than 100,000 kids who walked from Central America and crossed the southern border and were picked up by CBP. There's probably many more who didn't get picked up um, or who, frankly, were killed or injured on the way. And we're focusing on making sure that we're not deporting them back to the places that were so terrible that they decided it was better for them to flee than to stay and face those dangers that they had back home. We're focusing on not separating families and keeping families together and finding ways for families to be united here in the United States. And we're focusing on asylum seekers because these are the populations that under international human rights law, the United States is obligated to try to help them and to not deport them without due consideration of their circumstances. Does this, is this climate, are we, and we talked earlier a little bit about 9-11 and backlash there, and is, is this, are we reaching the apex of a 15 year crescendo, or is this the beginning of, the beginning something of something else? I think it's hard to know. I'm After, not asking you to tell the future, so yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's not easy. After September 11th, I was struck. We, we had some very similar responses. We had people saying we can't let anyone into the country. We had people who used Islamophobia as an excuse for locking up, deporting, detaining people of the Muslim faith or perceived who might be of the Muslim faith. Um, and there was not a lot of public hue and cry when that happened. Yeah. I think there's been a very significant change in the way that people have responded to President Trump's executive orders in the yeah. last few weeks. I think there's still, unfortunately, a very substantial number of Americans who are worried about national security and who do worry that not addressing immigration laws sufficiently could allow people into the country who want to do harm. But I think if you look at the numbers, the number of people who've committed terrorist acts in the United States over the last 15 years, a majority of them have been American citizens. Yeah. And a very substantial number of them have, not, have been white. So yeah. these are not necessarily immigrants who are causing problems. These are people often with mental illness or other concerns that we should be trying to address. And I think there's some public awareness of that now. So I think the responses you've been seeing to, for example, the executive order where hundreds of thousands of people turned out at airports and said, no, we welcome refugees in this country. That's new. We yeah. didn't see that 15 years ago. Yeah. And I hope that is the beginning of something, yeah. which is activism across the country to stand up for values that have never been partisan that have never been associated with one particular leader, yeah. that have always been part of American values here in this country. Rich, can you play the first, we're gonna, we have a little clip. I think it's a perfect, perfect segue. Ban the wall! No 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 Everywhere we go! Everywhere we go! 
Security shortly after the executive order came out. Woo! Is the United States global standing in the world changing in the last month? Yes. And the feedback you, I think you're uniquely positioned to answer this question for me because you have such worldwide contacts. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's two things we're really alarmed about. For a very long time, human rights organizations have relied on the United States as an ally to criticize and push other governments to address human rights abuses. And so at the United Nations or in other international fora, we frequently worked with the government of the United States to put pressure on other countries. And I think what we've all realized in the last few weeks is that the US government is going to have no interest in playing the global policeman on human rights issues, and in fact is withdrawing from a lot of its roles at the international level. I think the other big concern that we have is that there are all kinds of governments who are saying, wow, if the United States can get away with banning Muslims from entering the country or refusing to take in refugees or building walls on the southern border, then we can do the same. And we've already seen countries taking steps. The, the government of Hungary has already taken steps to ban refugees from entering following Donald Trump's executive order. So we know there will be other countries who will follow his lead, and therefore human rights abuses aren't just going to happen here, they're going to happen globally because we have encouraged and facilitated that. I know Obama had, had um, committed to 10,000, receiving 10,000 refugees from, from Syria. Is that correct? Am I correct yeah. in that? Okay. Have we, are, we, are we going to keep that commitment? No. So that was part of the executive order. Um, you all should know the United States actually had um, a tremendous track record on resettling refugees. So there's two ways that people can come to the United States as a refugee. One is they can try to cross the border and enter the country and then seek asylum. And we call those people asylum seekers. And President Trump's first executive order is actually trying to stop that. It's going to build the wall on the southern border. And it's going to turn back people who ask for asylum will be sent back to Mexico and told that their case will be heard while they stay in Mexico, instead of allowing them to be here in this country while their case is heard. The other way is to be a refugee that is accepted for resettlement. And that process is all organized through the United Nations. The United Nations has identified more than 21 million people in the world who are refugees who need to be resettled in another country. Most of them are being hosted by somewhere between five and 10 countries of the world who are all, by the way, in the global south and do not have the resources to host these 21 million refugees who showed up on their door. And the United States was actually the most responsive on this. We have taken in more refugees over the last decade than any other country. And in fact, last year, we admitted more refugees than the entire continent of Europe. So the United States has a very proud history of resettling refugees, and it's been a bipartisan one with support from both parties. Everyone has seen the value of giving safe haven to people who are fleeing violence. Last year, under President Obama, the United States in 2016 admitted 85,000 refugees, 12,000 of whom were Syrian, so he met yeah. his commitment. This year, between October 1st, when the government's fiscal year starts, and January 20th, 30,000 additional refugees were let in. January 21st, refugees stopped coming in, and President Trump has ordered an indefinite ban on resettling refugees. It, it will start for four months, but there's every expectation that it's it will be continue. continued after the four months. Um, so that means that the 30,000 that have been admitted in may be the only ones admitted in this year, but he has said that he would allow up to 50,000 to enter this year uh, which would mean an additional 20,000 could be let in later in the year, and they might be directed toward particular countries, for example. They might decide to let in more Cubans or yeah. more Venezuelans or something like that. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll switch gears. Yeah. Um, talk about um, women's rights and your guys' program, My Body, My Rights. Yeah. So Amnesty had a big global campaign over the last few years called My Body, My Rights, and it was focused on reproductive justice and particularly on helping young women understand what their rights are regarding reproductive health. 
Um, the, we, we did do some work here in the United States. Um, we learned, actually to my surprise, this was an issue I hadn't learned about, that in some states, uh, state legislatures have criminalized the use of drugs when you're pregnant. So if a woman who's pregnant uses drugs, she can actually be put in jail for endangering the life of the baby. Um, and there are a number of states that have quite a significant number of women who've been imprisoned while pregnant because of those laws. But in other countries, we particularly focused on laws such as um, making uh, abortions illegal, but accusing women who've had miscarriages of actually having abortions. And so across Central and South America, there are a number of countries who have imprisoned women who've had miscarriages. Um, some of them who have doctors willing to testify that the woman miscarried her baby. But they've been put in jail for decades um, because of a miscarriage. And I just can't imagine how incredibly terrible that would be for a woman who's lost her baby to then be imprisoned um, yeah. because of the concerns. So we did a lot of campaigning on individual cases. We did succeed in getting several women out of prison in El Salvador. We also succeeded in getting some women out of prison in um, Argentina and in other parts of South America. But this is an ongoing challenge. So even yeah. though we're not campaigning on it in the same way, we actually still have a lot of research underway and a lot of activism, particularly in our South America offices, where they're continuing to do a lot of work on reproductive health rights. What is Amnesty International done to improve young girls' education and educational rights in countries where they have been denied? Yeah. So actually there's a great story from our My Body, My Rights campaign. In the country of Burkina Faso, they had one of the highest rates of child marriage uh, in the world. Something approaching one out of three girls was being married before she was 18 in the country. And one of the biggest outcomes of that practice is that girls were being pulled out of school to get married and they weren't being educated. So because they were getting married at 14, 15, sometimes younger, they didn't finish their education. So Amnesty campaigned really hard to get the government of Burkina Faso to enforce the law that says that you have to be 18 to get married. And I'm happy to say that after a year of campaigning, the government of Burkina Faso revised its policies, actually put in penalties for any time a family married a girl child before the age of 18, and then undertook a massive public education campaign that included sending out government officials to all parts of the country to educate chiefs and villages and other community leaders about this new policy and the importance of not pulling girls out of school. So that's one example, but we've done a, a lot of work on this issue because girls' education is one of the key areas of human rights protections. Frankly, when you educate a girl, you not only help that girl, but you educate her family and generations yes. of her family to come. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's AMC currently doing to protect women? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, so Amnesty, like all other human rights organizations, believes in equality. Um, we absolutely push for equal wages for women, men, and all people um, for the same job. This has not been a major campaign of ours for a while, but it has been part of work that we've done, for example, to promote the International Convention on, against all forms of discrimination of, against women. Um, and the ratification of CEDAW, which is the shorthand for that treaty, um, is something that the United States has not done. So the United States is one of about 18 countries that have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of Women. Uh, and if we did, it would actually obligate the United States to do more to actually address the gender wage gap. So we've been campaigning for its adoption, but I can't say I'm terribly optimistic over the next four years that we'll see any progress there. I want to ask you a question about the death penalty. Um, which is, it, would you say it is one of your bedrock issues for yes. amnesty? Okay. Um, the Supreme Court blocked the execution of the Texas murderer Wednesday um, because of racial discriminatory testimony presented by his own defense team. Um, my question is, are we are we seeing a shift nationally in the death penalty? Are we, are we, yes. are, is amnesty seeing us um, as a country change our opinions on this? And if so, if that is happening, why? Why is that happening? 
you know, public opinion about the death penalty has shifted a few times over the course of our history. Um, we had the death penalty for a long time, and then yeah. public opinion shifted, and it was abolished. Yeah. And then it was reinstituted back in the 70s, both at the state and the federal level. Yeah. So it's been a long time coming to watch the pendulum swing, swing back in the other direction. I think the biggest case for why we have seen increased support for ending the death penalty is because of the work of organizations like the Innocence Project, which have proven time and time again that people yeah. who are on death row have been unfairly um, and unjustly convicted. <laughs> Often, race is a major component of those unfair convictions. And what we see, if you look at people who are sitting on death row across the country, it is disproportionately people of color who are sitting on death row. Not only African Americans, but also Latinos, and other people of color are sitting on death row in far greater percentages than white. I think that gives pause to a lot of people who might still feel that the death penalty could be an appropriate response. I think there's a lot of worry that if our justice system can't be blind to color and can't guarantee a fair trial, then do we really want to have the burden of an execution on all of our heads that we would allow our government to continue to kill people? Amnesty's position has always been that the death penalty is wrong. Yeah. And we think that if you are sent to jail for the rest of your life, that is actually sufficient penalty for any crime that you may have committed. Um, and that, has, that was a very controversial position when Amnesty took that decision in the 70s. We lost a lot of members who supported the death penalty and felt we should not take that position. But what we've seen over the last several years is that a lot of people have now come to Amnesty because we take that position. So I hope that we're, we are singing that swing back to opposition. Yeah. Um, was Just one other note. Whatever notes there you want now, to take. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you ever know you <laughs> There are now, I think it's 12 states who have formally abolished the death penalty. But there are another 12 who have not utilized the death penalty in more than a decade. So we are approaching the tipping point. And once we get more than 25, there are a lot of plans underway to bring a case to the Supreme Court, depending on the composition of the Supreme Court at that moment, right. to see if we can... I was, reading, I was reading California's history of the death penalty. And I was very disappointed, by the way, in your, in your uh, referendum mm -hmm. decision yes, last year. I, I won't blame all of you. But. Right. So I was at... And, um, it's been... 90, 2006 was our last. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting to see the history of, of, of it coming and going internationally. What are we seeing? We are such an outlier. Yeah. <laughs> All of our ally countries have abolished the death penalty ages ago. The Europeans think that we're incredibly backwards, that this is still something that we practice. Um, the only other countries in the world who practice death penalty the way we do are Saudi Arabia, China, North Korea. These are not countries that we should be in the same company with. So, um, I want to talk about the use of lethal, lethal force. Okay. Um, the Washington Post um, from October 13, 2016, mm -hmm. it said that the FBI will launch a pilot project earlier next year to begin collecting use of force statistics nationwide and create the first outline national database. Oh, it's our first online national database to both uh, a both deadly and non-fatal inter interactions. Um, have they done that? And <laughs> is this database, where, where are we at with this database? Because yeah. really to assess the use of lethal force, um, we have to have the data, exactly. right? So where is, do you know, are you familiar with where we are with that? Yeah, thanks. So let me just note, Amnesty did a major report in 2015. Um, and we did that after going to Ferguson. Are you all familiar with what happened in Ferguson two years yeah. ago? Yeah. Okay. Um, so after the shooting of Michael Brown, which was terrible by itself, there were huge protests that erupted in Ferguson. And much to our surprise, the police in St. Louis um, responded to those protests with massive force, uh, including <coughs> tear gas, including water cannons, including noise-emitting weapons that were used to hurt people's ears. Um, that included uh, shooting of rubber bullets at protesters. And they also started going after the media who were reporting the situation. They arrested a number of reporters 
who were covering the protests. So we sent, this was the first time that we actually deployed human rights observers domestically in the United States. Before sending them to um, Stand Around. It was in Ferguson in two Ferguson. years ago, two and a half years ago. And as we were looking at the situation in Ferguson, what we realized is um, we didn't know enough about what the state laws of Missouri said about when police can use this kind of violent response to protests. So we thought we should really research that so we can be accurate in telling yeah. police what they're expected to do. And much to our surprise, we discovered that the laws of Missouri allow police to shoot someone who's running away from them. Not because they've been convicted of a crime, not because they're <coughs> threatening to hurt someone else, just if they stop somebody on the street and the person starts running away, they're allowed to shoot them. And we thought, my God, that has to be the worst law we've ever heard of. <laughs> Surely this is unique in the United States. So we did a survey of all 50 states, and we looked at all 50 states in the District of Columbia to see what do laws say about when police can shoot someone or use lethal force. And what we discovered is that not a single state in the United States meets international standards. Now you might think, well, international standards, those are probably kind of lofty things that police agencies will never be able to live up to. Not, they're, pretty, they're just pretty basic, practical rules. Like, before you shoot someone, you should warn them. I'm going to shoot you if you don't comply. Um, they include rules like, if they have an innocent bystander standing next to them, please don't shoot them because you might miss and hit the innocent bystander. They include, you should try everything else before you shoot someone. You should try talking them down. You should try other weapons. You should try whatever you can do. And it should be the last resort. You should never just immediately take out your gun and shoot somebody. It should always be sort of the last possible option that you have. And you should only use it if someone is at risk. If somebody is threatening you or another person on the scene, that's when you're allowed to use lethal force. So this is not like high level stuff. Not a single state in the United States complies with those basic standards. 10 states across the country allow police to shoot to break up a riot. So every time police describe a protest in the United States as a riot, it means they can shoot into the crowd. And they can kill people who are just pro protesting on the street. We were horrified. <laughs> so we put this report out in 2015. And our big ask of the report was that the federal government has to collect data yes. on when police use lethal force, how many times it works, who gets hurt when they use it, and even if they shot someone and they didn't die, what, how many outcomes are we looking at? Because we have no idea. In the Washington Post started this data, but they're only pulling stuff from, from media news reports. media, news yeah. reports, and news media. And it's not scientific. I mean, it's amazing. Their research was Great. unbelievable, and their numbers yeah. that they came up with were yeah. really were fantastic. But so not, here's our challenge. Yeah. There are 16,000 police agencies in the United States. Every single one of them uses a different process to collect data. A lot of them don't even collect data on, for example, the age and race of the person who's involved in the altercation with the police. So to get 16,000 agencies to all submit information to one database where it can be looked at across the entire country has been impossible. And this initiative by the Department of Justice in the fall was to try to do that but they were starting with a voluntary program. So what's most likely is that those cities and maybe a few states that already have that data collection requirement themselves will be the only ones who are contributing them to the national database. And the literally thousands of other police agencies who don't collect data and who have no means of electronically submitting it to the, to the FBI or the DOJ, they're not going to actually do it. So we still, it's not, it's not going to work because it's not going to collect the data in the way we need. And I think the only way to do that is to actually require police agencies that they have to collect that data and submit it or they don't get federal funding for their police departments. And unfortunately, the Obama administration was not willing to do that. And I know that Jeff Sessions, as the new head of the Department of Justice, question. is not going to be willing to do that. Yeah. So we're not going to see the collection of data for the next four years. So we support the Washington Post. Yeah. <laughs> um, last question before I'm going to open it up to yeah. students. Um, how can students get involved today and become a part of your organization? 
Awesome. How can you? How can? How can these kids walk out of this room in 15 minutes and and be part of helping out? Okay, in one minute. No, I'm. <laughs> so there's so much that all of you can do, and I think what I really hope you take away from today is a sense of urgency that you have to be part of whatever's going on. Um, oh, oh, this is about them. Yeah. <laughs> For Amnesty, our greatest growth over the last several years has been among young people. We have Amnesty chapters or groups that start up on campuses. So if you all are interested and want to start a, a group here on campus, we'd love to help you do that. And there are many things that you can do either as part of a group or just individually. We have actions. You can sign up for actions that you can take. We, do, um, we just started a new texting program, so for example, if you would like to call your representatives in Congress, you can sign up to get texts when there are bills coming up, and we'll tell you what you can say and who you should call, and you can click on the email and it will call your representatives automatically so you can tell them what a terrible job they're doing <laughs> on protecting refugee rights. Um, you can also participate in our annual campaign on Right for Rights, that's to write letters for human rights. I mentioned that last year we had more than 650 people that Amnesty freed. Part of that work is every December we lift up 10 or 12 cases for really high focus attention. One of those cases this year was Chelsea Manning. And I'm happy to say that her sentence was commuted and Amnesty campaigned really hard to get that. So every year we see progress where individual people that we've lifted up as part of that campaign get released. And what it takes from you is writing letters, writing letters to the people who are in prison to tell them we have not forgotten you, we're still working on your case, and writing letters to the people who put them in prison, telling them you have to let these people go, they're prisoners of conscience, and it's time for you to recognize that and set them free. So those efforts really work. Last This year we had more than 4 million letters collected around the world that were sent, and I think now there have been two people who've been free from this year's Right for Rights. So those are just some of the ideas, but if you're interested, we can send one of our organizers up to meet with all of you and give you some more ideas of how you can get involved. Questions? Just follow us at, at, at Amnesty USA on Twitter, and you can retweet or um, see the different actions that you can take on a regular basis. Questions? Facebook. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, because um, I recently... I have been like researching and reading up on like, the West Memphis Three recently. I don't know if you know who they are. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, like, how how do we educate ourselves about like wrongly convicted people? Like, how do like how are we supposed to figure out like who's wrongly convicted and who's not? And then how do we get to the point where we can then contact them? That's a great question. So Amnesty actually has a whole system around urgent action <coughs> cases. And what we do is we take recommendations from people who know about a particular case. We do our own research on them to confirm whether they're a case we should be campaigning on. And then we send them out to our members around the world to take action on. So if you become a member of Amnesty, you can sign up for those emails and you can learn about cases all around the world. And you can also suggest cases that you think people should be paying more attention to. And how do you sign up? It's just like online? Yeah, if, um, but actually, if you talk to me afterwards, I can make sure I get you to the right people on staff who are leading that work for us. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think the media is doing a good job educating the public? I do. Actually, I really do. I, I'm not buying this fake news stuff. That is a complete myth. You know, journalists have the same obligation that we do as, as researchers. They can't just put something out there that they heard as a rumor. They actually have to go back and verify and document that it was a fact. So I believe in the media. Now, what I do think has happened over the last several years is that the proliferation of new media, and that includes online media and websites and sort of a whole host of ways in which people get their news today, has made it more complicated. And as Kevin was saying, we all pay attention to the media who put out stories that we're interested in as opposed to the ones that we don't agree with. And I think that that can make people feel like the media is being tailored to them as opposed to actually being factual. Mm -hmm. But I think there's no question that there's really good media doing excellent reporting out there, and I wish we could get them more support and attention. You don't think they ignore some topics? Always. <laughs> Always they do. But I also think there's, there's some amazing journalism in this country, and I'm 
so grateful to them because they make sure that they're getting stories out that otherwise we'd never hear about. Um, and I think it's actually good for all of you to be giving some healthy skepticism to anything that you read. You shouldn't assume just because it's in the New York Times that it's you know the right thing. Right. You should look at other sources too and, and try to challenge yourself to question what's real and what's not. But there's really good journalism happening. Like what sources? Do you just like? Do you I think you look at multiple, maybe? right? So I you know the mainstream media has always been sort of the go-to, but as as you know, there's a lot of stories they don't cover. So I actually pay attention to a lot of more progressive media, mm -hmm. but then I'm only hearing the stories that I'm interested in. I've actually been trying to force myself to watch more Fox News. Me too. You know? <laughs> I have. <laughs> it's, it's hard. <laughs> but it's important because it's speaking to audiences that I don't have a lot of interaction with. And I'm getting to understand a little more what news they're getting and what they care about. So that's what I mean. It, you don't have to always agree with it, but I think you do have to look for how are they reporting on the story differently than maybe another source of, of, it, of media is. Yeah. Thank you. Kate. Um, so oh, that's brave. As far as uh, the negative effects of climate change as a human rights issue, um, and the fact that I mean, I, maybe this is a pers this is definitely a personal thing, but like the idea that we're all entitled <coughs> to clean air, clean water, yeah. um, and a and a healthy planet that can support you know agriculture and things, the things that we need to live. How? You know, first, do you see the effects of climate change as a human rights issue? And if so, what, like, and is Amnesty International doing anything to work with that? And if so, yeah. what would that be? Yeah, it's a great question. So, one of the rights recognized in the Universal Declaration, which is what Amnesty uses as our mandate, that's what we work on, one of those rights is uh, the right to an adequate standard of living. And under that right, there's a lot of issues that are included. That's where, for example, the right to health sits. That's where the right to food, to water, to clean air, to housing exists. Um, they're not always spelled out. And when the treaty was written in 1949, there was not a lot of awareness of the environment as a serious human rights concern. There's no question today that it is. And I think one of the most telling facts for me was when I heard that um, the Department of Defense has been doing a lot of sort of long-term planning on where they think the biggest threats are over the next 10 years. And for them, climate is number one. So there's no question that lack of access to water, which is a huge issue in so many parts of the world, is fueling conflict that then creates other security risks for the United States. And as soon as water levels are starting to cover more and more land where people live and people are going to have to move, we're going to see even more conflicts because I don't know where they're going to move to. So it's a human rights concern for sure. The question is whether the human rights community is ready to respond. And I think the short answer to that is no. None of us have been ready to respond to this in a really significant way. And that is a, that's a flaw of governments as well as the human rights community that we haven't done more. Amnesty has been campaigning around issues of um, particularly corporate accountability where it yeah. comes to, yeah. to environmental justice issues. We have talked about the responsibility of corporations to yeah. make sure that the ramifications of their work in communities does not violate human rights. And we've done a lot of work on that. I'm happy to talk to you after about more. But it's not enough just to go after corporate targets. We have to talk about governments, too. And I think that is actually one of my biggest fears at the moment, that I'm worried that the damage that could be done over the next four years is actually not something that can be reversed. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I'm hoping a lot of things that we're going to see over the next four years can be reversed, but I don't know that the implications for climate are going to be one of them. Let's come over here. Mike? Uh, so I'm from Nigeria. and. Mm -hmm. You guys are doing an amazing job covering um, the Boko Haram issue and um, the missing Chiba girls and all. And so I just wanted to say thank you about thank that. You. Um, I have a question. From my understanding, um, Amnesty International is a nonpartisan organization, which is something really hard for an organization in the U.S. in yes. 2017. <laughs> and um, I went on your website today, and there were like seven news stories, and five of them were anti-President Trump stories. And my question is, how do you do your job protecting human rights and still appear to be, or still be nonpartisan? 
question. Great question. <laughs> um, so what you should know is that during the campaign, I was not allowed to comment on either of the candidates running for president because I represent Amnesty International. So if you checked out my Facebook page or my Twitter, I did not make any comments about any of the candidates, and Amnesty did not comment about the candidates. However, once you've been elected to your position, then I get to hold you accountable. You, if you looked at the website six months ago, you would have seen just as many criticism, criticism stories against Obama as you're now seeing against Trump. Oh my God. You guys did a lot on that. And deportation right. and enforcement right. issues. Right. I mean, we've been really, really critical right. of every president who's come in. And that's, that's the one opportunity we have as a human rights organization. We don't actually care which party you're from. When you violate human rights, we're going to come after you and criticize you. So the key for us is that you have to be in a position of, of authority, that you have responsibility, and then we're allowed to criticize the policies that you're adopting. They're not supposed to be personal, I'll say that. Like we don't, we don't criticize that we think it's dumb for him to go off to his Florida resort every weekend. We criticize him because his policies are really bad and because they have human rights impact. So that's, that's where our focus is. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. It's a great answer. <laughs> Um, we only have time for a few. Which one of you is like really going to be disappointed if we get out of here and we don't answer, ask this question? Go. Okay, as far as the immigration rates and the deportation of 11 million people, what do you see as the real long-term effects of that and how it's going to affect our relationships with other countries and how those could also be repaired if this is carried out? So you guys have to remember, President Obama deported more than 3 million people while he was in office. This is not new to President Trump, and we were extremely critical of his efforts to deport people. He tried to nuance it by saying he was only going after people with criminal records as opposed to children who, and families. But the truth is they deported a lot of people, including people who didn't fall into their categories. In fact, over the last two years, they prioritized deporting people who had just crossed the border and that includes that more than 100,000 unaccompanied children that I talked about earlier. Um, the kids who crossed the border in the last two years by themselves, they were part of the enforcement raids over the last year that the Obama administration was carrying out. So this is not unique to this administration, and it probably won't be unique to, you know, it'll probably happen again in whatever administration we have going forward. The most critical thing is that we have to fix the immigration law because we're going to keep having this problem until we fix those immigration laws and find ways for people to come legally who actually want to be here and want to contribute <coughs> to the country. I think my worry is that the, the biggest impact is actually probably not on the relationships with other countries because those relationships are already pretty bad for a whole host of reasons. What I'm worried about is the implications for communities here in the United States. There are so many communities that have mixed status. You don't usually find a whole family who's undocumented. You usually find one parent or a parent and a child, but not the other children and not the other parent who are being affected. So what happens is that you're breaking up families and you're breaking up communities. And I think that longer term is a much greater risk to the United States and how we perceive ourselves. We should not be a place where we're splitting up families and forcing people to leave the country because we don't welcome half of them here. And I think if that happens, and what we've seen is when people do return home, particularly to Central America, which I don't know how much you know about Central America, but right now they have one of the highest rates of street killings in the world. You're more likely to get killed on the streets of Honduras today than on the streets of Iraq. That's how many people are being killed by gangs in Honduras. So if people get sent home to Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador and become victims of this, that is going to have much longer lasting impact on families and communities here. And I think that is what I'm worried about. That's not reversible. So I don't, I don't know how we'll fix that. We have two more questions. Two more questions from you. Um, the Ziki up there and then something like that. Okay, so, so talking about the women rights of education, I have a question that... Um, so, you know, like, um, 
what is a possible or considerable solution for the hardships for pregnant girls, such as uh, in countries like Sierra Leone, they're experiencing like how to assure that every pregnant girl can get the opportunity of education, but also get the protection from negative influences or you know discrimination. Right. Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, so one of the biggest concerns actually is. Um, the United States has been one of the biggest supporters of medical care for women around the world. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the global gag rule. Some of you heard of that? This was actually one of the first executive orders that President Trump adopted. For the last several decades, uh, every time a Republican administration comes in, they adopt the global gag rule. And every time a Democratic administration comes in, they throw yes. it out. The global gag rule actually says that health providers cannot talk about abortion to their patients. If they do, the United States will not provide them with funding to do their health care work. Now, traditionally, the global gag rule applied to reproductive health care. So if a doctor in Sierra Leone was treating patients and did talk to a girl about the op options that she might have with a pregnancy, then he would could not use U.S. government money to do those options for her. But that doctor could receive funding to do health, other kinds of health issues, to take care of children, to do whatever. The new gag rule that President Trump signed a couple of days into office goes much further. It actually says that if you talk about abortion as one of the options for pregnant girls, you can't get any federal government funding at all. And so what that means is that there are literally going to be tens of thousands of women around the world who now have no access to health care because the U.S. is withdrawing all support for it. For me, that's a huge human rights crisis because for these women and girls, they don't have other alternatives to get that health care. It also means that a lot of doctors are going to be working without pay. Um, and we're actually going to see rates of abortion and rates of maternal mortality go up because people don't have access to the health care they need when they're pregnant. So that's not an answer to your question. That's actually how bad the situation is. I think there's no question that we have to do more to get other countries to step up in the interim. And there's actually a new initiative from the, um, one of the ministers in Sweden to get European countries to meet the funding loss that the United States pulling back is going to cost. And they will be stepping in to try to provide some of the resources to keep reproductive health care going. But that is going to be very hard to do. The U.S. was the big funder there. So we're going to have to do as much as we can to support that. Last question. Make it a good one. Um, so, I mean, in Obama's last term, he, like, promised that he would close one on the Yeah, I asked this question. <laughs> but he did it. <laughs> so, so glad you asked this question. Now, but if Obama didn't close it, I really don't think President Trump is going to close it. Um, no, you won't. managed to shrink the population of Guantanamo down to 41, and that was from several hundred people when he started. That's not closing it, just to be clear, um, but he did make some efforts. Part of the challenge that he faced um, is that a few years into his term, Congress passed laws saying that you could not allow those people to be um, transferred to prisons in the United States, and you it limited the options available to him in terms of what he could do. So the, the most he could do was to try to find another country to take the people who were being held in Guantanamo. I think it's safe to assume that the 41 people who are in Guantanamo probably really do pose some security risk to the United States and, and globally. But I also think that we should be able to try them and put them in jail. I think that holding them without trial is an outrage. Um, and I think that continues to be an outrage today. The big concern that we have is that President Trump, while on the campaign trail, promised to send more people to Guantanamo. And actually what I'm really worried about is, um, so far the people who've been held in Guantanamo without trial have been foreign citizens. What I'm really concerned about is what happens the first time he sends a suspected terrorist who is a U.S. citizen to Guantanamo. And then we've crossed a, a line that we haven't crossed before. 
Um, the military commissions, which have been set up to try those people in Guantanamo that they can, have been a dismal failure. None of the cases have been brought to a conclusion successfully. So it's essentially a place where we send people to die. And that is a stain on the US standing in the global community that will not go away until the facility is closed and we recommit to abiding by the rule of law. So we're, we're in a lot of trouble on that one. But we'll see. Uh, it won't be easy for him to send US citizens there. And he may just stick to sending people picked up in the global war on terrorism to that facility. OK. Wow, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you again.